Let's you need to find the skeleton. skeleton. How would you tell people that design? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you might remember one Dr. David Menton. The late Menton died mysteriously during a pandemic while working for an anti-vaccine organization, namely Antris and Genesis, whom I'm sure we all know about. Anyway, it turns out that not only did he do a long talk in 2020 about birds not being dinosaurs, in which he lied quite a bit, but he also did a similar talk about humans not being apes. The talk is called Three Ways to Make an Ape Man, which is just as silly as saying three ways to make a reptile lizard, since humans are apes the same way lizards are reptiles. But whatever, let's hear what he's got for us. Well, my name's David Minton, I, my background is a, a human anatomist. <laughs> so I guess that qualifies me to talk a bit about uh, the human body today. Well, it certainly makes him more qualified for this task than he was for the dinosaur talk. Maybe this one will be better. And the whole issue is God didn't make any ape men. Except for the fact that all humans are apes, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, and then we turn right around after we say God didn't make any ape man, and we say three ways to make an ape man. Kind of sounds like we're a little confused already up here, doesn't it? Hey, I didn't say it, but yeah, it really does. Well, I believe it's, both statements are true. God didn't make any ape man, and for that we'd have to look at scripture. And... Uh, what about three ways to make an ape man? Well, you've heard of ape man. I guess that's why you're here. Uh, humans make ape men. <laughs> Given that all men are apes and that humans make other humans, I'd actually have to agree. It's not like humans burst forth out of oversized pumpkins or something. Humans make ape men <laughs> in their mind. They conjure them up. For a human anatomist, Dr. Menton sure is bad at knowing where babies come from. Maybe he should sit through sex ed again and watch that live birth video I had to watch. You don't really watch a baby come out of a woman's reproductive system and then forget where babies come from. And uh, really the whole burden of what we'll be talking about uh, uh, this afternoon is there's three ways to do this. If this isn't the three God-approved positions for baby making, I'm going to be disappointed. And if anyone can think of a fourth way after the lecture's over, come on by and let me know and I'll add it to the lecture. Oh, I can think of a bunch of ways. Okay, well, let's uh, dig in. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so why don't we just begin there, too? Why don't we not? I'm not here for biblical eisegesis. If I wanted to know what a pile of mendacious morons think the Bible means, I'd read the AIG Bible articles. I don't for a reason. I honestly don't often have too many questions about what the Bible means, but when I do, I tend to do things like check the original language, and ask people who actually are scholars and experts in those languages and the biblical text. And if I specifically want to know how a particular faith tradition interprets those verses, I'll check with the famous works in that group, like St. Thomas Aquinas for Catholics, or St. Clement of Alexandria for the Eastern Orthodox, or John Calvin for some groups of Protestants. Please note that this is not an exclusive list for any of those groups. AIG's interpretations inspired by the prophetess they reject anyway have no interest for me at all. And even less so in the context of a video on this channel, where the most theological I think I've ever gotten is saying that the doctrine of perspicuity of the scriptures is nonsensical on its face, given the current state of schisms among those Christians who accept it. All that being said, I think it's time to cut ahead to when Menton is done quoting scripture at us. In case you're wondering, in this talk about human evolution, Dr. Menton takes some time to be homophobic, because of course he does. Well, evolutionists have a very different view, of course, of the origin of man. This is a very famous evolutionist, uh, comes from that Huxley family that were great champions of Charles Darwin. Imagine citing something from 50 years ago in a talk about a field that's moving as rapidly as paleoanthropology. And uh, this is Julian Huxley from a lecture he gave at the University of Chicago several years ago when they had a big meeting celebrating uh, Darwin's, uh, uh, what was it, 200th birthday at the time. Uh, in the he said, in the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer either need or room for the supernatural. He said, the earth was not created, it evolved. Now get this, so did all of the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, our mind and soul, as well as brain and body, and so did religion. Okay, cool, but in 2018, Brad Kramer said, Many people today, both Christians and non-Christians, assume that creation and evolution are contradictory beliefs. 
that a person either believes in a creator god or they believe in a natural process like evolution. I understand this perspective because I once held it myself. I still believe that God is the creator of all things, but my perspective on evolution has shifted. I now see evolution as simply a way of understanding God's creation through the lens of science. How did I change my mind about evolution? The first step was encountering faithful, trustworthy Christians who didn't fit into the boxes of creationist or evolutionist. These Christians showed me a deeper and better way to reconcile my faith with the discoveries of science. They helped me to understand the scientific evidence behind evolution and to more faithfully interpret the biblical account of creation. The list of these Christians include Francis Collin, Tim Keller, John Walton, and N.T. Wright, among many others. So I guess by the standard that some guy says a thing means it's true, evolution isn't incompatible with belief in God, including specifically Christianity. If you thought about that, religion itself, according to evolution, would have had to evolve. Everything that's real has to evolve. That raises so many questions, like, what do you mean by real? That's not a trivial question either. What it means to be real is a vexatious question in philosophy. Like, is math real? To be real, does something have to be a physical object? What counts as physical? Also, what do you mean by evolution? Because in the sense of a theory of evolution, it only applies to living things. Rocks and stars certainly did not evolve in the same sense that humans or elephants or pine trees did. Of course, what this probably means is that science broadly doesn't accept God as an explanatory mechanism, and David wishes it did. But if he just comes out and says it, it'll be too obvious even to the friendly audience he's preaching to, that he was just an anti-science liar. And so he just uses evolution as a synonym for science he doesn't like. Which, by the way, is virtually all of science. And so far from God explaining how man came to be, man will now, through evolution, explain how we came to come up with God. That would be a matter of cultural development, not biological evolution. The science involved would primarily be things like sociology and anthropology rather than evolutionary biology. Although, given that human brains evolved and those brains are the things capable of believing in gods, evolution does help explain the existence of humans capable of having such beliefs. So it's not irrelevant. Uh, I've come to the conclusion that Evolution is, can be considered a jealous god that will have no other gods before it. <laughs> that is, nothing can be held above it as being over higher than God. Interesting. Let's see if evolution would qualify as a god under common usages of that term. I'll use Merriam-Webster as it's sort of the go-to for American English, and this is a talk given in that form of English. So definition one is, quote, the supreme or ultimate reality, end quote. Well, evolution is an emergent phenomenon that only happens to living things. It's certainly not the ultimate reality because it's very contingent on the universe existing. So that's a no. Definition two is, quote, a being or object that is worshipped as having more than natural attributes and powers, end quote. Well, that doesn't fit. Evolution is a solidly naturalistic phenomenon and there are no temples of evolution where it is being worshipped. Definition three is a person or thing of supreme value. Well, evolution is neither a person or a thing, but rather a process. So, nope. Definition four is a powerful ruler. Evolution isn't a person that can rule anything, so again, no. In no way is evolution a god, jealous or otherwise. Well, let's look at what's the basic argument for human evolution. First of all, what's the pattern? Uh, what is supposed to have happened? Uh, this chart uh, presumes to go back about five uh, uh, million years ago here. This five represents five million years. I want to point out that this chart is apparently one made by Answers in Genesis, not by some actual scientific publication. Also, you can't just put an abbreviated generic name without at some point giving the actual full name. So at least one instance of A period should actually read Australopithecus, and also Homo should be italicized. Really, these wouldn't be huge problems normally, but it's just another example of the pervasive lack of concern for accuracy that is all over young Earth creationism. For a group that sees themselves as maverick scientists working against the blinkered and dogmatic consensus, to get the world to see the actual truth, they really don't care about getting things right. If you're a creationist and you're watching this, if you want to be taken seriously by the scientific community, but you can't get even basic formatting and language use right, it's just not going to happen. You might also want to start fact-checking things, but that's probably a bridge too far. If you did that, it'd be hard to stay a creationist, at least of the anti-evolution variety. And according to evolutionists, at about that time, there would be other people pick a different time, but about the five million point, uh, uh, there was a split here in this creature right here that's called an ape-like creature. They never call it an ape, they always call it an ape-like creature. I'll call it an ape. Apes are members of the superfamily Hominoidea, which includes the modern-day gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans. Apes have certain morphological characteristics in common, which we'll get more into later. 
but the common ancestor of all of them would also have had these morphological traits and would therefore be an ape. If they called it an ape, they would be showing that over five million years, apes evolved into what? Apes. <laughs> yep, because that's how evolution works. Once a clade is established, it either goes extinct or diversifies. But no matter how much apes diversify, they'll always be apes, just like they'll always be mammals. That's why they avoid calling that uh, ancestor that's supposed to be a common ancestor of humans and apes an ape-like creature. No, it's not. It's because creationists too often have taken the statement humans evolved from apes to mean that humans evolved from modern ape species, like Gorilla Gorilla or Pan Troglodytes. Hence the question, if humans evolved from apes, then why are there still apes? Which betrays profound ignorance of how the whole thing works. I think that this was an overcorrection and also gives the false impression that the common ancestor of all apes wouldn't recognizably be an ape, when it certainly would have been. Humans and modern apes evolved from an ape. Well, I happen to believe that apes came from ape-like creatures. I think chickens came from chicken-like creatures, too, don't you think? Yep, that's how evolution works. The ancestor of some taxon was itself a member of that taxon. The common ancestor of all chickens was a chicken. The common ancestor of all ground fowl was a ground fowl. The common ancestor of all birds was a bird. The common ancestor of all theropods was a theropod. The common ancestor of all dinosaurs was a dinosaur. The common ancestor of all reptiles was a reptile. The common ancestor of all vertebrates was a vertebrate, etc. Uh, the problem is this other one. And by the way, notice they don't waste much time and effort producing intermediates here. I could put in Dryopithecus or a few things like that. And Sivapithecus, Gigantopithecus, Otavapithecus, Akembo, Proconsul, Yazanopithecus, Mabokopithecus, Rukuviapithecus, Orangwapithecus, Turkanopithecus, Pliobates, Griffopithecus, Afropithecus, Heliopithecus, Nicholopithecus, Equatorius, Kenyapithecus, Ankarapithecus, Lufangpithecus, Uranopithecus, Runopithecus, Hispanopithecus, Puralopithecus, Anuopithecus, Nakalipithecus, Sumburupithecus, Auroropithecus, and Grecopithecus. Oh wait, that's 30 different ape genera, all more closely related to other apes than humans, or basal to humans and other apes. So, you know, about 10 times as much diversity as Menton had on his entire chart. So I guess the scientists are in fact doing a lot of work on the other apes, and Menton just lied to us. Or just doesn't actually know anything about work on fossil primates. Certainly the fossil record of non-human hominoids could be much better, but pretending that it's something that's just being ignored or for which we don't have data, is simply ludicrous. But basically, uh, nothing much happens from here to here. You're going from an ape to an ape. That's what's happening on the other side, too. It's just we're being more specific about what ape we're talking about. In this case, it's Homo sapiens. It's this direction that gets all the interest. Breaking news. Humans tend to be interested in humans. And that's why when an evolutionist finds a primate in the fossil record, there's much more... Uh, impetus to call it an ancestor of humans and to just make it a, a dead ape or ancestor of apes. Yeah, that's why after one quick trip to the internet, I found 30 fossil ape genera that are either basal to humans plus other apes, or are more closely related to non-human apes than to humans by the consensus of the paleontology community. No one cares about Turkanopithecus. That's why searching it on Google Scholar turns up hundreds of papers. It's one thing to disagree with the consensus in science. That's a good thing. We need iconoclasts in science, because science gets things wrong sometimes. Science is a liar sometimes. And it's people who disagree with the consensus that can help push science to correct itself. But one of the things that shows that you're not an iconoclast scientist, but instead just a crank, is making it clear that you don't actually understand the consensus position. In fact, it's a sign of pseudoscience, and at best, that's what young Earth creationism is. Menton was just now displaying for all to see that he was not a serious person. Here's a, not a, it's not meant to be exhaustive here, just some of the major points we read about and hear about. You know, I appreciate him saying that this isn't all the known taxa that could be on the chart. And that's fair enough. But if he decides to, oh, I don't know, say that his question marks or relative sparsity of taxa on his own chart is somehow a problem for evolution after himself pointing out that this is not the full picture, then we know for certain that he was dishonest and not just ignorant. Also, I want to point out that the x-axis is supposed to be how ape-like something is, but you can't do that and have other apes on both ends of the axis. Humans are as ape-like as it is possible to be because they're 100% apes. There is nothing about a human that is not ape-like. It's like having a chart with an x-axis that is canine-like on one end and fox-like on the other. Sure, foxes might not be the most typical members of subfamily Canine, but they're completely canine-like 
because they just are canines. Uh, the first one out of the chute here uh, that we're identifying is Artipithecus rhamitis. And right there is one of the reasons you follow the rules for when and how you abbreviate binomials for species. There's just a bunch of A's on this chart, and none of them are identified. And they're not even all for the same genus. There's Artipithecus and also Australopithecus. That just makes the chart confusing. As some would just call it Australopithecus for Midas. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. The only papers I can find using Australopithecus rhamnus are from about three decades ago, and there are only two of them. I don't think anyone is still using the term. In fact, while it was first published as Australopithecus rhamnus, the new name was amended to Artipithecus rhamnus only a few months later after the initial publication, and near as I can tell, no one has since been using the original name, as there really hasn't been any dispute that I can find that the species is distinct enough to warrant its own generic designation. Now, to be fair, what a genus is is fundamentally arbitrary, so all of this doesn't really matter too much. But yet again, it's that pervasive lack of familiarity with the literature or care to actually get the science right that permeates creationism. If creationists were actually the warriors for truth that they tell people they are, then why do they care so little about actually getting things right? Instead, we just get fabrication, quote minds, sloppy references that would embarrass someone in high school, never mind a person with a PhD who's presumably been trained on how to do things like fact check and cite sources, honestly, as well as to do a literature search, in order to ascertain and understand the consensus in any given field, even if they reject that consensus. Then there's Australopithecus animensis. You notice we're going to have a lot of creatures now with A in front of their name. That stands for Australopithecus. Yeah, except when it doesn't, like with the last organism we talked about. Which translates southern ape. Australo, like Australia. Pithecus meaning an ape. So uh, uh, this is Australopithecus animensis, supposed to be somewhere between Ramitus and this next famous one up here. This one you've all heard of. That's Lucy. You've heard of Lucy, haven't you? I can't say that this is wrong, but it's sloppy use of language that reinforces incorrect ideas about paleoanthropology. Australopithecus afarensis does not equate with the individual commonly known as Lucy, or to give her her more formal designation, AL288-1. She was a member of that species and is not the only one. We have many other individuals of that species that have been found, studied, and described, and she is not the sole or even primary source of information on the species. She is notable for her completeness and place in the history of the field of paleoanthropology, but by equating her with the whole species, it lends itself to the belief that creationists never seem to want to counter that essentially everything that is known about Australopithecus afarensis as a species, or even Australopithecus as a genus, is based on her and anything that isn't part of AL288-1 is just a mystery, and anyone who reconstructs an Australopithecus with parts that aren't present in her, such as a full spine or hands or feet, is just speculating about those parts of the anatomy, which simply isn't true. Lucy is a name given to one specimen of, uh, of this uh, uh, particular creature, and uh, the scientific name is Australopithecus afarensis. You know what? Credit where it's due. I didn't know he'd point out that she's just one specimen of the species, which does a lot to counter the idea that we base all our knowledge of the creatures on her specifically. I don't think it's entirely enough, but it's more than I'm used to getting on this topic. So hey, props to the late Dr. Ment. So now we get a fork in the road, and uh, one branch goes over here, and the other branch goes over here. Uh, in this particular drawing, not every evolutionist would agree with this, uh, what you're looking at there is Australopithecus africanus, not to be confused with afarensis. Some people say it uh, sort of became extinct. We call that a collateral relative that didn't make it. I had never heard the term collateral relative before because it's a term from genealogy, not phylogeny, and this is about phylogeny. In genealogical terms, it means a relative who is not your direct ancestor, so like a cousin. But in this case, I guess if it just means a relative of an extant species that left no living descendants, then it's the same as the term stem. So plesiosaurs are stem turtles, and in Menton's terminology, that would make them collateral relatives of turtles. It's weird for no reason to just come up with a new term for something that already has a perfectly serviceable name. But whatever, I'm not in charge of what goes on in AIG. I just point out how dumb it is. Uh, uh evolutionists call it that. No, they don't. Genealogists do. Evolutionary biology isn't genealogy, although there are some commonalities between them. In genealogy, collateral relatives are people on your family tree who are not your ancestor. So siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles. Always a good sign when the person giving a talk can't get what topic he's even talking about right. And yet again, we just have an example where creationists just don't care to be accurate. 
they don't care about being truthful. Others would put Africanus down here on this route going from Lucy uh, up to a relatively recent discovery, uh, and that's Australopithecus sediba. And I'll be talking about that and Lucy at some length. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, then about two million years ago, we get our genus Homo. Uh, how many uh, genera of Homo do we have today? One, because Homo is a genus. It's like asking how many suits in a deck of cards are hearts. One, because hearts is a suit. What would it mean for there to be more than one suit of hearts in a deck of cards? I don't know. It's nonsense. Homo is the single genus of genus Homo because Homo is a genus. One. <laughs> yes, genus Homo is one genus, like all genera are. Homo means ourself, basically. No, it's Latin for man or human, but not man as in male, which is the word vir. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's just one. Uh, how many species of uh, uh, human beings or Homo do we have alive today? Hey, look, a question that actually makes sense. And the answer is one. Just one, Homo sapiens. Sapiens means smart cookie. It means thinking, and is a reference to the ability of humans to have abstract powers of thought and complex communication to a degree unparalleled among extant organisms. I know he was probably just saying that as some kind of joke, but before you joke about science, you should make sure people actually know what's really going on so they don't think your joke is true. <laughs> or wise. You can see who named us, so we named ourselves. Well, it was Carolus Linnaeus, but yes, he was indeed a member of the species Homo sapien. And then, now we're getting the really delicate stuff here that you have very hard to see the difference. There's what's called subspecies or incipient species. How many subspecies of humans do we have today? Also one. And there are no recognized subspecies of H. sapiens in the fossil record either. <laughs> you were on a good roll there. You can hold up one finger again. Yeah, it'd be one. We're Homo sapiens, subspecies sapiens. In other words, if you didn't think we were smart the first time, we repeat it. No, that's not why if there were more than one subspecies of H. sapiens, the one modern humans belong to would be H. sapiens sapiens. It's because when subspecies are defined, the subspecies to which the specimen that defined the species in the first place belonged is just given the same subspecific name as the specific name. So because Canis lupus, the gray wolf, was first described based on the Eurasian gray wolf, that subspecies is Canis lupus lupus. But the arctic wolf, which lives only in North America and Greenland, is C. lupus arctos, because that subspecies is distinct from the one originally used to describe the species as a whole. Menton could choose to be informative, but he apparently kept making active choices to tell misleading jokes instead. Now, let's get down to a really narrow area, uh, and that is, how many races? That's even below subspecies yet. Racial categories in humans are arbitrarily socially constructed categories based on largely superficial factors like skin pigmentation, eye color, hair texture, and the shape of various soft tissue facial features like lip fullness, nose shape, and the presence or absence of epicanthic folds in adults. All of this represents only a tiny fraction of human genetic diversity, and these traits are not distributed in discrete groups. Human races are a product of human culture, not human biology. Uh, subspecies interbreed, species can interbreed. Uh, now we're down to race. And uh, after the Human Genome Project, you may have heard about where they sequenced the genes of humans. There have been several people groups who have been sequenced. The scientists have come to the conclusion that there's only one race. <laughs> there's not enough difference among us to really classify us in uh, different races. So uh, I guess you could just say what? The human race. That's pretty much it. Biologically, yes. Human races do not really exist. However, because humans all exist within wider cultural frameworks, the way that those cultures racially categorize humans can have effects on the life circumstances of those humans in various racial categories. Societies have often and still often treat members differently based on what perceived racial category those persons fall into, and that cannot be ignored in some misguided effort to not be racist by just saying there are no races. That race is essentially a figment of society's collective imagination doesn't mean that we can just ignore the way that it affects people. But oh no, I guess I'm teaching critical race theory or something. I'd better stop that before Marjorie Taylor Greene asks how much funding the USGS is giving me to teach people that, um, let me check, right, that racism exists and has existed. We're all brothers and sisters, ultimately. Look, I'm with Menton on the commonality of humanity and that humans should see each other as members of a single family rather than as a series of categories, 
all but one of which are conceived of as other. But the problem is that Answers in Genesis promotes colorblindness and harps continuously that children shouldn't be taught about the effects of the past and present racism. And their excuse for this is that races aren't real. That doesn't help anyone. And while my purpose here isn't to have a conversation about racial justice, it bugs me that Answers in Genesis will oppose actual attempts to correct for racism both past and present, while couching it in terms that they think make them look totally not racist to you guys. Well, let's get into the science of the lecture. Uh, I'll try to make it educational as well as boring. Well, my history with Menton seems to indicate that it will be boring on his end, but also not educational. In fact, whatever the opposite of that is. Like, miseducational or something. Hopefully, though, the entertainment part can be supplied by myself. But then, it's not like I spend a lot of time watching my own content here, so maybe I'm boring. I don't know. Hey, if I'm boring, tell me so in the comments. If I'm not, tell me that too. Heck, just like and subscribe and do the YouTube stuff. I could use more algorithm magic here on the tube of views. Uh, what's the difference between an ape and a human, huh? Oh boy. So, let's get into it. Now, if you've watched my previous series where Menton tells us about how birds are not dinosaurs, you'll know that he entirely failed to do the one thing that you have to do to have that kind of discussion. He didn't define what a dinosaur is, what a bird is, and then show us, based on those definitions, how birds didn't meet the criteria for being a dinosaur. Basically, his argument was exactly the same as saying that whales can't be mammals because mammals don't have blowholes and they have four legs, while whales have no legs and two flippers. I already know I don't need to tell you why that argument doesn't work. So, since I can basically guarantee that Menton won't bother to define ape, let's do it here. In morphological terms, which is what Menton focuses on, taxa tend to be defined by synapomorphies, that is, shared derived traits found uniquely in the group in question that are not found in other groups. That is, in contract to plesiomorphies, which are shared traits of a taxon that are also shared by a larger, higher taxon. So, for example, having a placenta is a synapomorphy for eutherian mammals. In fact, it's rather the defining trait of eutherian mammals. But it's a plesiomorphy for apes, since apes are part of a much larger group of mammals with placentas. Now, I'm not going to list every last synapomorphy or plesiomorphy of apes, but I'll go through it enough that we can easily use this definition to look at any animal and say that it is or is not an ape, provided we have enough of its body available to study. First, let's start with some plesiomorphic traits of apes so we know where apes are on the larger tree of life. Apes have a spine. This makes them vertebrates. They have four limbs, making them tetrapods. Apes make milk, making them mammals. Apes develop from a placenta during pregnancy, making them eutherians. Apes have fingernails instead of claws and orbits that are entirely enclosed in bone, making them primates. Apes have a dry nose as opposed to a wet nose like most mammals, making them monkeys. Apes have a 2-1-2-3 dental formula, that is, two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars in any one quadrant of the jaw, that is, top left or right, or bottom left or right. They also have nostrils that open facing down rather than to the side. Both of these traits indicate that apes are catarine or old world monkeys as opposed to the platyrines like tamarins or marikis. Apes have tails that fuse into a coccyx and do not extend past the body wall. They have Y5 molars and very flexible shoulder joints that probably, at least in the first apes, were used for brachiation, something even humans can do, albeit not as well as a chimpanzee, gibbon, or orangutan. Now let's look at some random animals to see if they're apes or not. We'll pick six species Elephas maximus, the Asian elephant, Vascularctos cenarius, the koala, Gallus gallus, the chicken, Chromia monilis, the necklace starfish, Mandrillus sphinx, the mandrill, and finally Homo sapiens, the human. Okay, so let's go through first our plesiomorphies, and then if we can get there, our ape synapomorphies. First, the elephant. Well, it has a spine, four limbs, and they make milk and have placentas. So they're with apes at least until eutheria but they don't have fingernails or enclosed orbits, so they're not primates. If they're not primates, then they can't be apes, so elephants are not apes. Let's look at the koala next. Well, it, like the elephant, has a spine, four limbs, and they make milk, but they don't have placentas, so they're not even with the apes into eutheria. They are instead metatherians. Since you have to be a eutherian to be an ape, koalas are not apes. Well, let's take a look at the chicken. They have a spine, four limbs, but don't make milk, so they're not mammals. Chickens, therefore, cannot be apes. How about the necklace starfish? Well, it doesn't even have a spine, so it's not even a vertebrate, making it most certainly not an ape. Now here's a tricky one, the mandrel. It has a spine, four limbs, milk, and a placenta, so we know it's a therian, like apes. 
but also has fingernails and closed orbits, a dry nose, and a 2-1-2-3 dental formula, and nostrils that face down. So it's a catarine monkey, the closest to apes so far. But does it have the distinct synapomorphies of an ape? Well, it doesn't have a coccyx, instead having a short tail. It doesn't have Y5 molars, nor does it have the super flexible shoulder joints of an ape. So despite being very close to being an ape, mandrills are not apes. Last, and certainly not least, we come to Homo sapiens. Well, humans have a spine, four limbs, milk, a placenta, fingernails, and closed orbits, a dry nose, a 2-1-2-3 dental formula, and nostrils that face down. Right now, humans are hanging out with the mandrills as catarine monkeys. But humans also have a very flexible shoulder joint, a coccyx rather than a full tail, and Y5 molars, putting them solidly in the ape category. See, this is how you tell if an animal is or is not part of a morphologically defined group. You define the group using the morphological traits both that it shares with the larger taxa to which it belongs, but also the traits unique to it. Once again, I want to stress that my list of traits is not complete, and while I do think it's sufficient at the lay level for anyone to figure out if an animal is an ape or not, it wouldn't pass muster in a peer-reviewed paper because it leaves out a lot. So let's see how Menton did it, and I can guarantee it won't be in any way that's useful. Uh, the skull is the most interesting thing to look at. Wouldn't you agree the skull is more interesting here than, say, the toe bone? Yes, I would agree that the skull is more interesting than the pedal phalanges, but both are important, and I'm not sure I'd agree that the skull is the most important thing, but it's sure in the mix. What's the difference between an ape and a human if we start looking at the skull? Look at other parts. I have a list for you here. We can just go right down the list, and uh, I'll illustrate it with uh, some skulls. These are made out of resin or plastic, so they're not real like skulls, the but they look I real. The they're pretty expensive, the Shelbyville? They're a replica. I a new heel for my shoe. So I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So this I is tied an onion to my belt. And uh, the first difference between apes time. and humans we could point out are the nose bones, the nasal bones right here. If you break your nose, that's what you break. You break the nasal bones, okay? And we have two of them. You can see the seam in the middle if you look close. Uh, and they're like a little awning that hang out at the front of our face here. And uh, apes don't have protruding nasal bones. Well, what does it mean to say that apes don't have protruding nasal bones, but that humans do? Well, since we are trying to argue whether humans are or are not apes, we need to see if this alleged characteristic means that humans are missing a plesiomorphic or synapomorphic trait of apes. But they aren't. The protruding nasal bone is a derived characteristic in humans, just like flippers are a derived characteristic in whales. You can't use either flippers or a protruding nasal bone to distinguish whales from mammals or humans from apes. You have to show some key feature that apes do have that humans don't. Pointing out that humans are unique within apes is all well and good, and that's why we treat humans as a distinct species, rather than just, you know, a variety of some other species of ape. But it doesn't help us say humans are not apes. You might not be surprised to hear, but what I just said is going to be a theme for the rest of the series. But I think we'll continue next time. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me what you didn't like in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, I hope you hit the subscribe button and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always alerted when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Ben Tobind, Tapioca Weasel, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Elderon Teller, Barava, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, San, Sphincter of Doom, and the Venerable Bead. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.